Uh, Paul says, what's the hardest part of endurance racing that no one talks about? Uh, besides going the bathroom on yourself, mm. um, all the pee. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This week's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. You love Off the Record. We love Off the Record. Get lots of emails about how Off the Record is helping you guys. And big news, very important. We have a new code for Off the Record. That's right, new Off the Record code for the app. The uh, website is still the same. Off the Record com slash TST, but if you're using that off-the-record app, download it, have it in your pocket, be ready. The code is TSTPOD, T-S-T-P-O-D. Get that off-the-record app, put it in your pocket, use code TSTPOD, and off-the-record will give you 10% off all current and future legal fees that you book through Off the Record. In case you haven't figured it out yet from listening to the show, Off the Record is the best. If you get a speeding ticket or any kind of moving violation, don't plead guilty. Call Off the Record. Well, don't call. Use the app. Go to the website. Send them your ticket. Put in some basic info about what happened. Off the Record will set you up with a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction where you got that moving violation. They will fight it on your behalf. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to appeal. Matter of fact, you don't have to do much of anything. I used off the record recently because I got a big one. I was allegedly, allegedly doing 94 in a 70 in Northern California on my way to uh, the performance car of the year test with Jethro Bovington and uh, Huck, our photographer, in the car with me. And they were like, oh boy. Farah is in trouble. And I was like, no, Bovingdon, I am not in trouble because I've got off the record. And I bet him there and then that nothing would come of this incident. And I just last week got the text message from my OTR team saying dismissed. Not not a seatbelt, not a nothing, fully dismissed. That's what OTR can do for you. They have a great success rate. Download that off-the-record app. Use code TSTPOD and have that type of protection for yourself. It's easy, uh, it's straightforward, and, man, can it keep you out of trouble. Offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST, not code TST10. Scratch that. Offtherecord.com slash I've been saying it for three years. So i got to change it up. Code TSTPOD on the app. All right, folks, in studio today is a uh, legendary Porsche Works driver, Patrick Long, one of the co-founders of Luftkegelt, one of the most uh, famous uh, Porsche shows. Uh, and he's got his new thing, Air Water. It is, uh, is a new Porsche thing. They sort of dipped their toe into it last year on the tail end of Luft in San Francisco. And now we've got the details of the new one that's happening in 2024. Plus, we're talking about uh, the 911 with portal axles, the mountain climbing 911 that both Patrick and our own Zach Clapman got to drive. We're talking a little bit about the 911 ST, his impressions of that, as well as my impressions of that. Uh, we're also talking a little bit about electric race cars. We're talking a little bit about historic race cars, racing vintage Formula One cars, and how sketchy they are, uh, as well as things like uh, the proper fitness regimen uh, for being a race car driver, and a whole lot more. One of our best racing driver pals, Patrick Long, here today. It's the Smoking Tire Podcast. With Pat Long embargoed, in studio. Embargoed. Embargoed, talking about air water <laughs> while wearing a Luft hat. Yeah, that's right. Draw the I think, connection. We, I think we need new merch. Move that it. mic a little closer to we you. Got it. We got um, it. We're, we're one step ahead of you. Welcome to the new studio. Thank you. This is impressive. New, yeah, it's all right in here, isn't it? I like it. Good I like place this to do radio. Is this Live Edge? Yeah, Black Walnut, Live Edge. Nice. Got to do it. Nice. It's I'm thick. A, it absorbs sound. I'm a son of a carpenter, but I know nothing about it. Oh, really? That was my backup plan, the wood shop. Shit. I'm glad, I'm glad racing worked out. <laughs> Me too. That's Me way too. better. I didn't need to be breathing sawdust all day. Yeah. A uh, bunch of things going on. We're going to talk about air water. Uh, this year's Air Water. You also just threw it out there uh, that you uh, just had a go in the ST, which I had five days in the ST, so I want to compare notes with someone who really knows what they're doing. And then you also drove the, the portal axle thing, which Zach got to drive last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and have you also driven the GT4 e Performance, the electric race car? I've been around it, but yeah. I've not driven it. I had a go in that. What do you think? 
Neat. I mean, fucking cool. Really? Fast. Really? Yeah, yes, but I drove it on ice in Finland at the ice experience. <laughs> Lower. Not a bad deal. <laughs> No, it's fun, yeah. but on ice, what's the difference between 400 and 1,000 horsepower on ice? I mean, yeah. there is, isn't any. Yeah. And I was with, um, oh, who am I blanking on now? Uh, Richard uh, Leitz. Leitz. Yeah, who he's was awesome. Awesome. Yes. He was he was a he was an ace. He was a character. He's a legend. And he's building a really cool rally car. I, I mean, for GP ice race. Yeah, or for fat. For whatever they're calling tire. it. Yes. Yeah. So. He, he was a teammate of mine at Le Mans in 2007. He was a rookie. And he barely spoke English from the Austrian hills and showed up and just had the best dry humor I've ever come across. He was great. He was yeah. a great instructor. I had a, good, I had a very good time. Yeah. But you can't – it's really hard to talk to each other in that car. It's so loud in there. Really? Yeah, because all the straight cut gears, it's, it's basically the same as a cup car once you're in there because it's just – yeah. You know, that's right. Uh -huh. I was on track with it at Ren Sport. Um, I got the ultimate invite to drive the 963, the Porsche oh, Penske yeah. current prototype. And uh, when I came up on, I was like, oh, I'm going to blow by this thing and it got on the <laughs> gas. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, it's I mean, it's for everyone who's driven on, on tarmac says it's just the, the amount, the way it puts down power is really wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. But on ice, it's what's cool is that it's very. You can dial in the experience, and you can go all from all the way front wheel drive to all the way rear wheel drive, and then they put in this left foot brake oversteer feature. Nice. So when you left foot brake, while you're on the gas, it disconnects the front drivetrain and overdrives the rear drivetrain to add angle, which is really cool. Torque vectoring as well. It's only two motors, so it doesn't have left to right torque vectoring. I feel like I should know this. Eh, it's not your job. Not anymore. Not anymore. But uh, but it was cool. But um, ST. So ST. we had five days with the ST, yeah. and you just had to go. So what did you think? Well, I'll start off by taking my Porsche Ambassador hat off and say that the modern product in that genre is, in my opinion, a big weapon for yeah. public streets. And <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm like, I'm always defaulting to, I want to go out on a drive and I want to lean on a car. I want to yeah. rev a car out. So I grab like a hundred horsepower 912. Right. Um, but I loved it. I left the undisclosed location and headed home, which was only about 10 minutes in that car for me, up over Mulholland, down Decker, super tight, mm -hmm. second gear. And it was, it was fun. I was thinking about what, made me smile in that car and this sounds very like basic but sometimes you need to drive a modern manual car to remind yourself that you still know how to do it <laughs> to remind yourself that like you yeah. you're, i'm still a good driver I, yeah. I i can blip on a downshift and i know what gear to be in without looking at a rev counter but it, it had that old school feeling and and beyond that i think that the diff was the one thing that i felt um Jörg Bergmeister, an old teammate of mine like richard leitz is very much in the know now uh and and with Andreas Proninger and the GT car guys, he's been working on a different setup that's more stock when it comes to how they're adjusting the differentials. Mm -hmm. And I like what they did with this car because mm -hmm. they're not trying to do a track car. Yeah. This is like the ultimate Canyon Carver yeah. and I did enjoy it. People always ask me, what's your choice between PDK and manual? And I'm like, if I'm on the racetrack or daily driving, it's PDK. But if I'm going out in the canyons, if this is a weekend car, I'm yeah. still manual. Will you, can you explain to people like the difference quickly, like the, the the differential change and then how that is different on a road car versus a track oriented car? Um, I think I felt it first in the 992 GT3, the standard, and then of course in the 992 RS and now a little bit different in the ST. And I think what you're really looking at is the amount of lock on the way into the corner, rear stability, versus how direct and how quick does the car change direction. Well, the GT3 and the RS are ELSDs, and the, S, the ST is a manual mechanical. mechanical LSD. Correct. And, yeah. and then the other side of that is the rear steer. Yes being removed for the ST. But to your question, how does that differential make a difference on track versus in the street? I mean, is that is that your question? Yeah. I, I would say that you're carrying in a lot less brake force. You're not braking at the last second and carrying in this massive trail brake. So on the race cars, we often wanted more lock, more preload, more rear stability for that ultimate low 
last second braking, where in the streetcar, it's more about rolling that center, keeping your momentum up if you're in a canyon, and what that connection is like. Do you have that disconnect between, mm -hmm. all right, this is my entry speed, this is my direction change, and this is my exit. To me, in a streetcar, when the rear end or the differential isn't refined, you really feel like there's three parts to the corner versus one. Mm. Mm. Cool. I thought the ST, the word I kept going back to, and we have a video uh, where I compared it direct back to back with the GT3 Touring, which was a really interesting hmm. experience. I don't think if you drove the, if you drove those cars six months apart, may, you could tell the difference. An average person, even a good driver, even me, six months, and I'm, I, I'm not to put myself above above those, but like someone who drives lots of cars. Because people ask me all the time to compare two cars that I drove two years apart. Right. And it's you need, easy to- You need to do it right away. You got to do it right away. Otherwise, it's just, you, you cannot do it. And so to get the GT3 Touring, and they had a Touring on the launch for Zach in Italy, so he could do it, but I actually did it on the video. Um the, the ways in which the ST is better and the ways in which the GT3 Touring are better were surprising. Hmm. The Touring, when you had some quick switchbacks, you could do more with less. Right. It would, it, a few less degrees of steering, and it was really snappy through the corners. But the ST was so much more settled on its tires the rest of the time. Sure. I would so much rather take a road trip in the ST than the Touring. It's one finger on the highway. Right. One finger at 12 o'clock, and it's just c going straight. How about weight comparison? Could you notice that? Dude, like only Porsche does, because the 84 pounds difference doesn't seem like that much in the context of a car, but it's where it's been taken from sure. that just makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. It just felt, it felt, the ST felt like a smaller car. Mm -hmm. It felt like a livelier car. It felt more connected. Um, it was fucking great. I mean, I, I did 400 miles on that car in four nice. days in L I, without leaving L.A. Nice. I was just driving it and driving it and driving it. And, uh, you know, that, that engine has no rotational inertia at all. I it's agree. crazy. I agree. I agree. I've never driven a car, even a race car, that has so little rotational inertia in the engine. No, it was very, very slick. I also, I took my wife to a movie in it and she kind of rolls her eyes because I get in a car like that and I, when I get a chance, I want to get on it yeah. within legal speeds. <laughs> and um, it's, it's interesting because I was told, you know, it, it had a cage in the back. Yeah. It's obviously for, it's a European car. Um, and they, they talked about less sound deadening. They talked about all these things that I thought might make it a little bit more visceral, maybe a little bit more noisy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel any of that. Only it was under 3000 RPM where you get that chatter from the gearbox in the back. It sounds you like a Ducati. Yeah, but to me, it was more faint than I expected. I yeah, thought yeah, I was, yeah. like when I first drove a 991 GT3, the first time we went to PDK, I heard it a lot more than I did now. So well, that's because the engine had bits of metal going around. <laughs> no, com <laughs> no comment, no comment. I have no idea what you're talking about. No, it was, it was, um, it was nice. I also had to make note that I'm a big thing on, a big guy on ergonomics. Yeah. And that shorter shifter was, mm -hmm. was nice. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that makes is, is the shifter actually shorter than the GT3's shifter? It is. The shifter Oops. itself? Yes. I'm 99.9% .9 sure. Because someone said that to me, and I drove these two cars back to back, and oh, really? I could not feel the difference. I know the final drive is shorter, and I think that whoever wrote that email to me I believe, was confusing the two. I haven't driven, actually I haven't driven the Touring, so um, it I, could I, be. I, I, if it, if it gonna, is different, I couldn't feel right it wrong. going back to back. Yeah. But also, the black car that I drove, as I mentioned before, had a little funkiness with the shifter yeah. as a result of the fact that it had 5,000 of the hardest miles right. ever driven on any car. I did notice the shorter uh, ratio. The ratio the final, you do notice. Final drive. Yeah, yeah. It, it was nicer because, again, we don't need to be going 180 miles an hour on yeah. California roads. Yeah. So give me, give me short, raspy upshifts and downshifts. But what was so great about the ST is it really oh, felt— The shift lever is 10 millimeters short. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, 10 mil. 10, 10 I mean, centimeter, yeah, not, not okay. massive. Well, it's what, it's something. All right, but uh, I apologize to whoever said the shifter was shorter and I was wrong. I, I did not notice, but okay. Like um, four inches. But if I ever have a fact, with cars, Patrick, you if are. I, I ever have a fact that Matt Fair doesn't have, I will remember that forever. Dude, <laughs> yeah. we, can't, we can't all have them all. So I apologize <laughs> to whoever uh, said that to me and I, and I said you were wrong. You're right. Um, 
That's the touring up on screen? The green one is the touring, and the nice. black one is the ST. S, the black is a terrible color for the ST. It hides anything that makes it different from the regular GT3. You can't see the cutout on the side at all. Um, but what was so great about that car is that you could buy one today, assuming you could get one, and you could drive it for 20 years, and I really don't think you'd get tired of it. I think you could drive that car until the end of your life, and I don't see what about it would become less fun. Can't imagine wanting more power. What, what do you? What could? What else could you want out of a sports? No, car? it was it was great. I want to try the um, optional seat. I the fixed the back comfort seat. seats. Yeah, the the fixed back seat for me. I guess I had too many decades of racing, yeah. so um, like I need a little angle adjustment and some some creature comforts. I'm with you, man. Yeah, because I drove that thing for like I don't know three hours a day for two days, and at the end of the third hour on the second day, like the lack of lumbar was starting to bother me because we were just doing highway transit back to base. And I was like, yeah, you know, these look cool. And, on, and in the corners, in tight corners especially, I mean, they do a magical job of keeping you in place. But if you actually wanted to drive that car for 20 years and take it on the highway, for me, I agree with you. Comfort seats, they hold yeah. you in really well. And then yeah. You have a little well, the, the GT3 Touring in this photo that we did for the comparison <laughs> had the comfort seats in it. And I got in that and I was like, yeah, this is what's up. Give me the comfort seats with the heritage inlays, those yeah. pinstriped inlays. Yeah, in yeah. Red. Mm -hmm. well, we Very had retro. for a while here at Westside, we had uh, Jensen Button's GT2 RS. Nice. Miami Blue, White Sock. But exclusive manufacturer comfort seats, and I was right. like, "This is yeah. the, the fucking F1 champ. Right. He knows. He gets. He gets. <laughs> he definitely." Have you had gets. him on the show? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we have. Yes, he's, he's a rad he's, guy. He's yeah. great. Twice he's actually. Very legit. Very, uh -huh. very authentic. We went to his cottage at Goodwood. Oh, nice. And had it when we got when Goodwood got winded out. They canceled it. We're like. Let's go to Jensen's house and do a podcast. And we did, and it was fun. Was that for the festival or the, the revival? The festival, yeah. I just did the revival at the oh. end of 23. It is like a bucket list, yeah. probably yeah. number one, and it lived up to all the hype. What did you drive? I drove a 65 911. So every three or four or five years, um, you get a 911. Usually it's been a 911 class at the members meeting, which mm -hmm. is kind of the warm up but this was in the main show it was two driver format i think it was an hour race unfortunately we had an incident at the beginning with a a, a well-known name in the porsche world um so i didn't get a ton of laps it was like one session learn the track in the car and the event like 20 minutes uh between two drivers and then straight straight into the race but i think there was 45 or 50 cars standing start three wide standing start it was it was fun i hear the track's kind of hairy it is there's no margin of error. You need to be sideways. You're on a Dunlop bias ply, so you, <laughs> sideways is the way. It almost looks exaggerated when they huck the wheel into the corner to get the rotation, and then the tire allows for slip. So even with whatever we had, 200, and, 200 horsepower, yeah. you can drive off the corner with the rears um, under power and sliding. So it was uh, it was a rad, rad experience, and some really good drivers. Jensen was there. Weber was in it. Uh, Mark Weber, uh, quite a few great drivers. So oh, sorry, I'm trying to find a picture of you, but it's not the uh, that's the next one to go to. This Zach and I, there was Festival of Speed. This was our first time, and it was great fun. But everyone, oh, you got to revive, got to revive. But one thing we've been kept being told over and over is it's impossible to record podcasts there because it's just the races are so loud. Yeah, I mean, you could find some quiet zones like where the drivers hang out. They have this period correct hospitality for the drivers and their families. You could pull it off in there, but hydration stations just bourbon, and like yes. a piece of bread, <laughs> well, well, cig well, cigarette machines. Yeah. <laughs> You're there are there are like the cigarette girls walking around really? like in oh, period, boss. But I will say that it really does get you in the mood to like have a brandy or whatever because everybody's dressed in period mm -hmm. and I always had heard that and I was like yeah so you throw on a blazer and no it's like head to toe yeah. it's like a dress contest and yeah. so I was stressing hard where on it. Where did you get your outfit from? I reached out to my Hollywood wardrobe specialist sister-in-law and she was like yeah I have better things to do so <laughs> I went <laughs> so I went and found a Hugo Boss suit at the Salvation Army Goodwill oh, okay. or whatever and everybody thought like what a disappointment your first Goodwood and you're wearing some dude's old business outfit yeah. but it was perfect yeah. in my opinion it was perfect and I spent like a hundred bucks head to toe Great. when most people are walking around there and ten thousand dollars worth yeah. of stylish I imagine gear. it's right. like it's a contest to see who can do it the best it's impressive yeah. it, it, that in itself was probably one of the very best parts of the whole show and well, that's about, everybody if everyone's driving around in someone else's car you wore someone else's suit you're actually more period shit. correct than they are <laughs> exactly yeah exactly that's awesome upcycling yeah yes that's cool i bet Precisely. it's so much fun 
Um, the uh, so one other thing I wanted to say about ST before we totally moved on. Eh, fuck it, it's over. Go watch my video. Go watch. Uh, go watch uh, or go read. I wrote. I wrote three thousand words Whoa. for Road and Track. Yeah, and that will be out Monday the twenty second. It lives up to its hype. Fantastic. Oh, yes. the comfort seat. So my dealer, shout out to him, Town Porsche, Englewood, New Jersey. I always give him love. Uh, they, that's where I got my pink car. Um, they said, we do not, we are getting one and you are not important enough for it. <laughs> it's not and I was you. like, I understand. No problem. And they go, but, but we're going to try something if you, if you want it. There's a procedure that we can like Hail Mary where you build one and the owner of the dealership approves it. And the regional GM approves it, which they will, they will push your build to Germany. And then if Germany approves it, Porsche has been holding back allocations for special occasions. Well, there you have it. You need an outlandish design. You, so so they Ooh. said they if they approve your build. Right. Oh. So, so they I go, need to like so your taste. They need to like your taste. Nice. And you need so that needs to be approved by so so I go, all right. And by the way. I cannot afford this car. Mm -hmm. Even if they sell it to me at sticker, which was not even discussed. Sure. <laughs> you know, like the how much this would cost didn't even come up. <laughs> but I was like, let's build one. So we went to the configurator and built nice. one. Comfort seats was the first yeah. must have comfort yeah. seats. There's a new color for this year. And Zach, you should Google it. South Seas Blue Metallic. It South is, Seas. So it's very like the water of green. Tahiti. Yeah, I was gonna it's say it's fucking awesome. So no, look no, at that. No bus interior. Well, I mean, you can always go. That's not that. It's the new one. It's uh, I. It was in the configurator. Oh, I, you're talking paint color. I thought you were talking interior color. No, 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 no paint. Nice. Uh, that go, go up, Zach. Go up. I see red. It's south. See on that GT on the RS Spider. That's it. South Seas Blue Metallic is this color. It actually looks better uh, in – this is a fairly dark photo, but it's I'm it's like the fucking water of Tahiti. So I put that in with the leather comfort seats, heritage pack with the hound's tooth. It will probably not happen. Yeah, it's more blue than I thought, but you see in the highlights where, like in the sun, it will definitely – more of the green will come out. It's fucking a cool – and it was – the color is so new that the, my dealer – was like, uh, where did you, there it is. My dealer was like, where did you find that? Look at that. On the ST configurator, I mean, with the silver wheels and the silver trim, looks great. Yeah. That's and nice. that's not PTS, that's standard. It is PTS. Oh, got it's it. not PTS plus, it, is, it. it is PTS. Oh, I, I went, the So compared here. to Mexico, it's much more, it's lighter and more metallic than Mexico. Although even though it doesn't look it in the, in the swatches, it's the more, swatch looks darker, but in the car it looks lighter. The car it's more it has more metal to it and it's yeah. more like an actual sky. The yeah. Mexico blue has a little more teal to it. Yeah. Folks got to take a quick break for today's sponsor Factor. New year, new resolutions. Get started on them with Factor. Be ready for that new year. Hit it hard. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery service takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in 2024. Skip the grocery store. Skip the prep work. Skip the cooking fatigue. Skip the fast food. Instead, get chef-created, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from each week, including options like keto, calorie-smart, vegan, veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons. You'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Man, love Factor. As I've said a million times on videos in the podcast, one of my biggest problems is booking myself so busy that I forget to eat. And I know you're looking at yourself, you're looking at me going, but, but, but you're fat. You're not, how do you forget to eat? How does that work? If you forgot to eat, you'd look like uh, Christian Bale in The Machinist or something. But what happens is when you forget to eat, you get super hungry from not eating, and then you make bad decisions. It's either fast food, it's unhealthy food, it's what's available now right in front of me. You, you order a meal from like a meal delivery service, but then you're snacking because you're so hungry before the meal gets here. It just leads to problems, right? 
but you can skip all that. Factor, it's flexible. You can change your order up every week with plans from four to 18 meals per week. Pause, reschedule your deliveries if you're traveling. There's no prep and no mess. Just throw them in the microwave for two to three minutes and you are good to go. And not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook or too busy or too tired to eat out, they also help me stay on top of my fitness goals. They've got the Protein Plus and the Keto. I don't do the Keto, but I do the high protein meals. That's what I need in my diet is low carb, high protein. Factor's got it. Help me stay on track. It's going to come in handy this year. Get over to factormeals.com slash tire50 and use code tire50 to get 50% off. That's code tire50, tire50 at factormeals.com slash tire50 to get 50% off. You got to do it twice. Once in the URL, once in the code. Right? Factormeals.com slash tire50 and then code tire50. 50% off, baby. Now, back to the show. How I went, cool, right? I went on to yeah. help a friend spec out a, a 3RS and I was overwhelmed by how many options there are. Yeah. There's too many options. Yeah, it was yeah. like I had to get to the, like the top five yeah. and then refine from there. But I'm, like I'm liking a lot of the dark greens these days. I, I don't want a bright, fast car because I just still think like, yeah. that is a... It's a magnet. magnet. But uh, but having lived with the ST for a week in a in a really, you know, black. Yeah, it's not All enough. of the subtlety of the ST goes away if right. you don't. Sure. You're, you can paint a GT3 RS black, you'll see the wing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know? It's kind of the opposite yes. objective. Exactly. It's the opposite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Bo Bachman uh of uh, Galpin uh got his his you see his 3 RS build? No, but let me guess. It is bright. It's chroma flare pink. Holy cow. And the paint was $100,000. It has, it has $250,000 in options on it. Dude, I love He's like, oh, I yeah. saw him the other day. He's like, dude, I went bad shit. <laughs> he does oh not give shit what anybody thinks. He doesn't. He is going down his path, and it's awesome. Oh, I, it's I, I so commend fun. him. I it's, commend I him. I can't wait to see this car. He's like, it's, he's like, this car is so crazy. I don't know what I'm doing. He's got, he's got a rad collection going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that whole museum downstairs is like all just like his shit. It's Dude, great. I remember I met him for lunch and first time we had met, great guy. It was right at that time when the pandemic was creeping in. So it was like, do you shake hands? Mm -hmm. Or like it was still very, very new, the idea. And then I didn't see him for a couple of years for obvious reasons. And when we came out of the pandemic, that dude had a Porsche collection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because when once he opened Porsche yes. Santa Clarita, yeah. he was like, well, now I'm a Porsche dealer. Like, let's go. Yeah. And so he's he's got this enormous collection of yeah. stuff that's been brought over from Europe and Japan. And he's just buying stuff. Oh, he's going for it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had, I think he had an RWB, maybe one or two 911s. But after the pandemic, when I went to see the store, <sighs> it was every the basement was full, and like they were like, you know, <laughs> probably on. probably telling me more about how many of those cars were his than than yeah. he might want me to yeah, tell yeah. everybody. No, no, they. they I mean, it, it, there is like it's, but it's what he's into. But like, cool. God bless, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, ST right ST with comfort seats. Oh, that's a good one. NATO is Olive. That, is that the color you like? I was trying to find one for you. Yeah, that was that what, was the, that was the color I landed on. That was really I because with the RS, there's so much of that black wing and everything yeah. that it it went well with all of the black trim and such large amounts mm -hmm. of carbon fiber reinforced plastic. But NATO olive is a great color. That's and even like those wheels. That's the that the good. touring that we had out was oak green, which looked Ooh, yeah. really yeah. really nice. Yeah, I mean, over good. a cognac interior, fucking yeah, all that was day. A really good spec. Shout out to Jeff who brought uh, his GT3 touring for Wait, us real, to drive. Patrick, what was the racing like at Goodwood versus? Historics, Monterey, all that stuff. Because you've done a lot it, of vintage driving yeah. and racing and yep. demonstration driving. Like, yep. What was Goodwood like? It was serious. It um, looked serious. These guys were there a week or two prior testing. Uh, there was a one open day for the the 911 class. Uh, the level of driver, the level of car was was pretty close in spec. I mean, the the rule book is very close, but there was definitely some headliner cars. Um, but yeah, I was driving as hard as I could, and I think I got up to, like, sixth by the end of my stint, 
but I w- there was nothing. I was not going further forward than that. I mean, was wow. everybody ahead of you like has a Le Mans podium or an F1 podium or you know? It's more that they're experts of that tire mm-hmm. and that class. They they run the two liter cup. I think there's five stops around Europe, and these guys are dialed in to like what makes yeah. those cars churn. I think I think isn't tricky. Tim isn't Tim Pappas running a car in that? Too? He was he yeah. Was? Jerome Blicamon was his yeah, teammate. Yeah, they were yeah. quick. They've been running in that series. And that's Eli's your own getting from, ready to uh, do more of from that. Lamborghini, right? Doesn't he drive for a Lamborghini? Yep. He yeah, really drives a little bit of everything. He's been my instructor at uh, oh, really? at some Lambo really good events, dude. and he's the the man. Yeah, he's great. We've had, we had a lot of fun in uh, STOs yeah. and in Storados yeah. together. You wrote. He's You're, very. cool. He's like one of the most famous dudes that you might not have heard of in the sense that his dad was a Formula One driver, and he's driven everything on the way up in single seaters and karting, and then now makes his living as a a freelancer as a sort of uh, free agent GT driver mm-hmm. and can go fast. One weekend he's in a Corvette, the next weekend he's in a Lambo. He's very good in Porsches. He's just uh, very versatile. Yeah. And I shared a car with him uh, a couple of times with Tim. And then also uh, this summer I, I made a little bit of a journey over to Spa for the 24 hours post-retirement, uh, go, going back in for one last drink. And yeah, I was sharing a car with him. And that was the one thing after being out of the race car full time for two years, you recognize how much of your career as a pro driver is sitting and waiting. Yeah. And so we're at it's Spa like being for on TV. F- five days. Yeah. You're just sitting in the trailer. Yeah. So it's always good to, to hang out with him. Yeah. He's a solid individual. I think Chris Harris and Eli were yep. in a race exactly. car together, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. And Eli's got the bug hard. He, he, yeah. he got bit and wants to do more. So we're talking about doing a couple of races this oh, year. Oh, cool. They bringing that to America, you think? Or is it going to be all Europe? I don't know. Uh, I think right now it's all Europe, but Eli brought a couple of his cars back, and I know he's been terrorizing. Uh, Ape, what's it called? Apex. Apex. Yeah, yeah, Apex out in Still Arizona. Still tried that so. course. I'd like to yeah. try. It. It's fun. It's Is technical. It it's a little tight. It's like a thermal. Uh, yeah, smaller, less less options of different racetrack configs, but that same idea. Mm. And they're building all their garages now. Or the last time I was there, they're probably done by now. But not too far out of Scottsdale, where I hang out when I see Eli over there. So it was fun. Cool. That's rad. You guys, uh, can you guys fill me in on the portal axle car? I'd like to hear about that thing. Yeah, yeah, that was. What's the story with it? Up. I think Zach was a, a little more informed and formally invited when he showed up. I um, <laughs> got the call late and bounced over. Um, I thought it was incredible. I mean, I've raced a couple different config cars at Baja, but I don't consider myself an off-road expert. And it was just fun. It was fun because Porsche had a really good closed course off-road, and they put some obstacles up on it. But to go back to kind of that idea, it turned out that it was kind of an internal brain bubble from some of the guys in Vysock, and they started mm-hmm. working on this thing Saturday. What, what do they they call it? The Saturday Car Club? Yeah, it was like a it was a weekend project car in starting in like twenty eight. 18 and they started doing they did test runs in chile so they built the thing in germany and then they tested the system and the articulation and stuff and then they went to chile and they tried it and they came up a little short but they learned a lot but then COVID happened so then they got a lot more time in the lab because they're like well now we're sitting here for like a year so then they built a second car uh and what's most amazing so so they built this first car which is not the one we're looking uh we're looking at the second one the first one they called doris d and then e but the first one, when they built the portal axles, they did like designed the whole thing in, in CAD or whatever. They built it once and it just worked. And they're like, well, that's it. And I mean, they overbuilt all of the suspension arms. They're fucking two inch thick aluminum, like all milled from a block. Mm. It's rad, but none of them ever broke. Um, so they overbuilt it like the four GT sort of. And then they went and tested it. And, and um, we can get into the specs if you want to. But when they came back and built the second one, they shaved 400 kilos out of it. Which is without wild. without reducing capability. Yeah, they wow. they Priest. they changed the wheels from like steel to. I mean, someone said they were carbon, but they looked aluminum. So the wheels got lighter. They took out the roll cage because they realized we're not going to actually flip the car. Um, and then all the body panels are carbon. Mm. I mean, but taking out nearly yeah, well, nine hundred pounds yeah. from a car. I mean, is dude, amazing. T- the ST is eighty five pounds lighter than a GT three Touring, and they're charging a hundred thousand dollar right. premium yeah. for it. So yeah. that's what you're. That's what we're talking about. Oh, did you drive the, them both? I drove them both. Yeah, I, I drove the newer one first. Got it. And you could definitely feel the weight, but the big thing, and you're gonna be interested in this, is steer by wire. Yeah. 
Yeah. Guys, we got to take just one more quick break. For Dylan Optics Sunglasses, they have been around since 2010. I mean, they've been around longer than that, but they've been supporting this show for 14 years now. Our longest-running, most consistent sponsor, Dylan Optics. They're the best. They make the best sunglasses on the planet. They make them right here in Arizona. Well, in America, but Arizona. Uh, those amazing NIR double-polarized lenses with the super cool matte finish. They're customizable on their website, so you're never going to see someone else out there with the exact same Dylans as you. Choose your frame. Choose your lens color. They even offer prescriptions if you need prescription sunglasses. All you got to do, go to thesmokingtire.com and click on that Partners tab. That's where you'll find the Dylan Optics link. If you use that link from our website, we will send you a shiny new Smoking Tire t-shirt for each pair of Dylans you purchase, thanking you for supporting the people who support us. I wear these sunglasses every single day. I've got dozens of pairs of them. I wear them for uh, for fashion. I wear them for function. The wraparounds are great when I'm riding a motorcycle. The aviators are great uh, when I'm traveling and want to be kind of cool. If I can be cool, I really can't be, but I try to be cool. And then you've got those Wayfarer styles for the California beach. They are awesome. Go to DylanOptics.com and check them out. Or better yet, go to TheSmokingTire.com, click on that Partners tab, use the link. We'll send you a free t-shirt for every pair of Dylans you buy as a thank you for supporting the people who support us. Now, back to the show. Yep. The second car has steer by wire. Full steer by Full wire? Full steer by wire, uh -huh. which when it wouldn't calibrate the first four times for me was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, they, then once I got it working, it it makes a lot of sense for an off-road application. And sure. The, the difference, like they could dial in the feedback. So they said that Romain Dumont, when he drove it, wanted all the feedback. But for me, there was very little. So if I turn the wheel and the car starts to turn and you let go, it just keeps turning. It doesn't yeah. straighten out. But there was zero kickback. Yeah. from rocks, ruts, all that stuff on the road. Like okay. all you do is point the nose and there's nothing interfering. There's no jiggling of the wheel, yeah. no thumbs out or any of that stuff. It was weird, but it was really effective. I, I think I'm some very of that anti stuff... steer by wire. I don't like steer by wire. Yeah, I, I'm with Zach. I felt the difference and I think that for what he was going over, whether it was ice or rocks or the commitment at that high of altitude with that little amount of horsepower, I think he needed it. And I think they learned that from the first time they went up in the in really how much kickback there was yeah. in the wheel. Mm. I mean, it would be infinitely more exhausting to drive the car that has all the feedback because they're just going over ice. And like you said, just did, 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 did. and over time, sure. that would just wear you out a bit. I'm, I mean, for look, that specific application. Oh, no, okay, I'm, fine, I'm with you but... because once it wouldn't calibrate, and granted, if they, if they, especially if Porsche ever puts it in a car it would for a production car, it would only be after it's been bulletproof for like 15 years. Right? Yeah. It was just very funny after the discussion we had with Cybertruck, <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and they're turning the car off and on and off and on and off and on. And then, and then it works, and then it was fine. But, yeah. you know, it was, but just, like, it was my first steer-by-wire yeah, experience. Yeah, and you're and like, yeah, there's, there's th there is a chance this might not work. Yeah. Which is not, so, um, you know, calibration serious. But it's yeah. it's a stock Carrera T engine, extra cooling, stock seven-speed manual transmission, and then the portal axles reduce the gearing by a factor of four. Right. So, so it's full. It's the lowest of low ranges. You're I in think, fourth gear pretty quick. And you're going 20 <laughs> yeah. miles per hour. <laughs> Did you? If you're just on flat ground, do you just like start in fourth gear? No, I started in first, uh, but you. Sh I mean, you shift even when you're reading it in k p k kilometers per hour. You're like, that's not many. Yeah. <laughs> and then you do the math. You're like, oh, I'm going five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't like a tractor wear for that course, which was probably like a mile, yeah. maybe a little longer. I never felt like I was wound out or wanted to go faster. So you could see why they needed that ratio. But I True. was. It's I was, four by four, right? It's four wheel drive, right? Uh, it was. I think they had it in rear wheel drive when I drove yeah. it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But it was the it was the Calamigos Ranch. Off-road thing. Yeah, that's yeah. where we were. So. And most of the time, they they wrote the piece. They said that Ramon was most of the time in his successful record-setting climb in two-wheel drive. Yeah. There were certain sections where he used all-wheel drive. Hmm. But, man, just the altitude and the lack of oxygen yeah, and everything the time, they had you, to do as a yeah. crew up there. I think there was 15 guys with yeah. him. And it so sounded like they sent him off at 3 in the morning and yeah. then tried to catch up to him where he was at the finish. So. They kind of set up these waypoints of people yeah. to help or whatever. And then, and so, you know, Tangent Vector sent someone to film it. You know Will Barber, right? Yeah, of course. So Will Barber is one person I used to work with, extremely fit individual. And he went on the first test, and he his body, he and he was cycling, and he's very strong, and his body just didn't respond to the altitude. And they had to switch it out for someone else on the team who 
just dealt with altitude better. Hmm. And I mean, that was an interesting part. And Porsche said that the engineers had to go to these atmospheric chambers yeah. to get tested before they could be put on the team to go to see like, how does your body respond sure. to 20,000 feet? Is the car yeah. down to like 80 horsepower by the time you get to the top? They said it's cut in half. So it's half, it half, half oxygen. So they said yeah. it's like 200 horsepower. Yeah. But when you're when the gearing is the way it is, you know, yeah. it seems like speed is fine. Did it feel like a Porsche? Yeah. Did? It, it felt like it felt like TJ uh, Russell's car, uh -huh. but if it could only go 25% as fast. Right. But I mean, you know, soft shocks, all that stuff like it rode it was really solid. Yeah, it made the right noises. Yeah. Manual gearbox made it extra fun. I don't think yeah. off-road could be any it's other It's interesting way. that they I want what was there why did they choose manual gearbox? Was that a specific reason? They said they wanted to demonstrate the manual's uh, durability. Oh, okay. Um I don't know. Probably the first car I know was like a zero car, like a pre-production car that they just yeah. were. Yeah, it was a car they were going to yeah. car they were going to so crush anyway. It might anyway. have just been that they started that way, but it could have Very been true. something to do with the portal axle as well, like what they were Ooh, good getting point. Into. Yeah, there might be too a lot of electronic controls and stuff that yeah, that you through, deal yeah. with with PDK that would just be easier to not have to fuck with. It's so, cool, man. I love purpose built stuff like this. Yeah. And you think the video will be cool? Be no, interesting? I don't think. <laughs> I think I, I might slow off road videos just tank on no, our channel. Really? Yeah, yeah, nobody they won't gives do a fuck. Well. Uh, Are they shooting from outside the car too? They got some outside shots and some. And I I told them I was like this. You know, I don't know what we're gonna do with this, but podcast conversation having it now <laughs> yeah, yeah. road and track wants a, a written on the website and fine you know, the route was no joke you but, can't get cocky up there because you would go a long way down i mean i was oh the, yeah the first time i went up i was thinking to myself i can't believe with no discussions with no track map review they just sent me up the hill and Same i thought way. you could go down a long way on this trail it yeah was that the, trail is where jeep will send you to show off their new four by four products yeah, right. so like that's the that's the comparison that that we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, and then they built a bunch of obstacles, huge rocks and two-foot dips so that you could feel all that portal axle leveling. Which was really cool. The whole suspension system is yeah. so weird. There's a there's a, a rod, well, it's three sections of a bar, but like, you know, two-inch thick circular steel rod that's running from the front suspension to the back suspension. Right through like the transmission tunnel, you can reach down and touch it. Okay. And as you're going over bumps, it's moving back and forth. So it's working as an anti-roll system, kind of like a 48 volt system would be, but this is all mechanical. So hmm. as like the right front wheel goes up, it is then exerting force on the back and pushing the left rear down, keeping the body level. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so interesting. Dude, it, but you're just sitting there and you're hearing and you yeah. look down and there's this fucking bridge support <laughs> that's been it's recycled like, into a suspension piece and it's sound, just going It sounds back like the Golden Gate Bridge in a high wind. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. It's wiggling between you, man. It's kind of weird. There were a lot of flux capacitors in the inside of that car. I put it up on my I put it up on my story and I got in again, no pre-information and I was like, what is all this shit? The second the second car? Uh, first car was the first time I got in, but yeah, the second, the second car, car has just computers. Yeah, second car was a lot cleaner. Yeah, well, except and for there, the there's your GPU weight. next to you. Right. Yeah, but there's your weight argument too. I'm sure they got a lot of that stuff electronically uh, onto the car that was. Well, it's like the the first car still had room for a passenger seat, but it had the roll cage and the heavy wheels, and then the second car. The entire right side floor is like computers and batteries and everything for the steer by wire system, mm. um, but it's carbon fiber and they and they got rid of the roll cage because they realized they're not going to flip the thing. Yeah. Um, did you have you ever driven a car before that had? I'm sure you have like the the shocks that went across the back. Yeah, like the third, in, like the third damper suspension. kind of. It had a third shock that oh. ran from rear, right rear tower to left rear tower. Oh, Koenigsegg does that. That's yeah. the Koenigsegg triplex suspension, yeah. you yeah. call it. Yeah, the horizontal rear shock. It yeah. was cool. So as, yeah. as both rear wheels got compressed, that compressed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was it on was, the front too, right? Oh, maybe it did. I, didn't, I yeah. never opened the trunk yeah. or the front, so I couldn't see it. Yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. Have you driven, you've driven like, I mean, I know you have. You've driven the Baja cars or like the Safari cars. How I have not driven the uh, Dakar yet, but um, a lot of vintage stuff and right. Did this remind you of that at all, or was this such a science experiment? And so it's really big too. I was different. I I thought that this was way more capable in that. I mean, the approach angles and the wheel travels. I mean, everything was so much further than anything other than like a factory prepared class twelve car at Baja. I had never driven anything as capable from any brand um, and and pretty pretty fun
Yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely, I don't know, something, I don't do a lot of off-roading, but something about the technical side of it and just, they basically said, hit what you want at what speed you want. Yeah. And that is just, that's, that's a good, fun. That is a good set of instructions. Yeah. Just yeah. point the wheel at something yeah. and just go. I was Dude, like, are there more people that coming to drive told, this thing? Because uh, I might break it. That was what I was told when I drove a Sherp. You ever seen a Sherp? No. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Get Patrick a picture of the Sherp. I yeah, probably know when I see it. Yeah, you'll know when you see it. It's this like Russian thing that's like technically it's an ATV, but it's it looks like <laughs> yeah. you ever seen those? Yep. And it's, it's, like amphib a bug. it's amphibious. It floats. You can drive it into water. You could drive it over a, a tree or a car or fucking anything. That's right. They were just like, yeah, just literally point it at anything and go and you're fine. Boulders. Yeah. That, that bottom image anything. is pretty red. And the one on the top, the Sherp Arc, the top left. So you can connect this trailer to it, which would be, which is then remote driven. It's a powered trailer, so it becomes a ten by ten articulated RV that can go over anything, including water. I see your adventure wagon and raise you. So sick. <laughs> it's and you steer it with levers, like tank style, but it also has a five speed manual transmission and a, a Kubota diesel tractor motor. Where'd you drive that? In Bemidji, Minnesota, nice. in the winter. Nice. I cannot recommend one highly enough. <laughs> it is it is exactly as fun as it looks. It's cool. Yeah. Um, that's fucking rad. So let's talk about air water. Yes, that's, sir. Uh, in, in theory, that's why you're here, not to talk about well, weird yeah, I, um, science projects. I don't know. You know, the last 10 years has been a journey with Lyfkakult. Um, started as, hey, let's do something that caters to a, a newer audience when it comes to vintage cars, vintage Porsches. Um, and Air Water is an answer and an evolution and a different a different run at it. It's a, a clean slate. We've, we've ramped up. We started in... I'd say 2019, we did a, an evening event before the Universal show uh, with water-cooled cars, transaxle, modern 911s, four-door segment, whatever, and it, it went really well. And there's been so many people that have been knocking on the door saying, we want the Luft level of production, we want the curated photograph experience, but we want new race cars. We want to yeah. see the Flying Lizard 997 RSR, we want to see uh, a 944 Turbo, and uh, we ramped up with a, a soft launch of it Sunday of the 2023 Luft that you were at and you brought yeah. your car to. Which was great. I, and, had a, uh, I had a lot of great feedback from that uh, from that event, and it was really, really fun fun thanks yeah so and this it was is functionally the same i mean at the, it was functionally the same thing as luft this the location and the set and a lot of the people were the same it was just you changed out the cars right and so um, this is a, a a bigger stab um we're going to a southern california location that we plan to land this at and grow it um it's a lot more of a festival spirit if you think about luft as highly curated all about photographic moments about history of cars race and street this is like going from a a uh, Saturday night club to a festival, a music festival, in the sense that a lot bigger, still with the photographic moments, still with the vintage cars, but also letting the more modern Porsches play. And then I want to have a lot more of a marketplace, a more community-driven focus, uh, commerce, information, restorations, aftermarket, you name it. I see this as an epicenter for Porsche once a year, where this is your annual jaunt, if you're into the brand or you want to learn more about the brand, I think there should be a little more for everybody. And I think that Luft was always driven by the venue. We've mm -hmm. moved the venue every year. We want to tell a fresh story and we want to give new visuals. With Air Water, I'm not abandoning the curation. The team, Jeff Sward, everybody still wants to give that same high level of detail. But we want to be more inclusive. We want more cars on scene. We want more people on scene. So um, I'm pumped because it's a new challenge. I'm, I'm at the base of the mountain and uh, we're going to do things differently. So what are you allowed to talk about right now? Further, like, can we talk about the date? We yeah, yeah, can, yeah. Where, where is it? When yeah. is it? Um, so it's April 27th, okay. Saturday, um, Costa Mesa, California. Okay. Um, Orange County is not something that we've done with Luft. Um, I see it as a big center and a sort of midpoint for those of you who are not from SoCal between San Diego and LA. Um, close to the coast and easy to get to. Um, a lot of Luft has always been about people sort of trekking to the event mm -hmm. to meet up with everybody that they know online. Um, I think that at Universal, the stats came back 48 of 50 states, 22 different countries. So we, we like getting to this location because we have the capacity, the infrastructure, the staff to let people rally and come with a big group. So Is it like at El Toro or something? 
Well, oh. well, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. It's it's more refined than that. I didn't know you couldn't. It's more refined than that. I had a fire last year, so. Yeah, that one might be gone. Yeah, but yeah. Um, no, it, it will have. So some of the criteria we want in everything that we produce as a small team is diverse architecture and backdrops so that you really see these cars Monday morning on your devices in different light. I don't want the same aesthetic every single time. And Jay-Z is the master at that. He knows uh, the film world. He knows what looks good on a photo. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun at Mare Island because there was so much yeah, of that diversity. Yeah, there was a yeah, lot. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Mare Island will be hard to beat, but mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, far from an empty parking lot or a big open space. Yeah, but Zach and I don't have to drive seven hours to that's there. right. So there's that. there's no journey this time. Although that was a lovely drive. Mm -hmm. It was a good. That was a great weekend. That whole weekend was so much fun. That was fun. I didn't get to see the show that you guys produced on site, but or, it was or fun. Listened, we had, but you I had mean, a lot of one, guests at one so point. Many. Yeah, I think we had. I think we had ten guests that on the show for like <laughs> uh, ten minutes at be, a time. Yeah. Uh, we had and P, the guests were really good about showing up when we told them to show up. So it was like, and you're off, and you're on, and you're off, and you're on. And I think we, at one point we had over 200 people watching, um, which was cool. Nice. Um, so we would we'd love to do one again. Which, yeah, let's uh, do it. Which which we just need to find, uh, you know, whatever the right little corner of the world. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Uh, obviously, if you if you would like my pink car again i know you don't want we don't need full repeats but that car's uh that car's got quite the following we should we should get that back it's got a, a good story and i like i like you talking about it so one of the things that we've always talked about is yeah you want vintage you want modern you want race you want street but i think when you talk about people and getting everybody together i'd like to see like one of the legend german you know socal guys like dieter from andai on yeah. your show even though he doesn't like doing media but then also Highlighting a lot of the younger builders who took a 914 from, you know, buried up to the frame rail and yeah. brought it back in their own creative way. We've always liked to tell those human stories and put as much light on the, the kid from the Midwest who built and drove his car to Luft. And we're going to continue to do that with Air Water. So we got a couple more format changes and little tricks up our sleeve that uh, we'll, we'll be sort of sprinkling out as we get closer to April 27th. Cool. Is is Porsche themselves interested in getting on board with this yet, or what? Uh, not so far. Uh, they supported Mare Island. They brought out some really cool cars. They brought out the Penske 963, um, the new Dakar. Um, so they've always been a fan and have been really helpful in helping us find a certain car that we're trying to tell stories of each year. We try to pick some themes and get little sort of corners where you can go immerse yourself in Transaxle or go look at Overland Cayenne or go look at 996 race cars in the different generations. Start with a cup car, 996 Cup, 996 RS, 996 RSR. So we're not quite to like all the vehicle um, curating yet, but we're going to go live with tickets uh, right right now. And uh, oh, once, yeah, Tuesday. When yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So once once we open that up, it'll be pretty straightforward. It's you want to have a car at Air Water or you want to come as a, an enthusiast and check everything out. It's A or B. With Luft, it's gotten very complicated because there's a lot of demand and not a lot of supply when I talk about the amount of people that we can fit into our venues. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to streamline this and we wanted to uh, give a, a different appetite. Not everybody's going to love it. Luft will remain Luft. Luft is a different date. It's a different location. And actually, I feel like Air Water gives me and the team a little bit of latitude to refine Luft to its very best pieces without always having the pressure to grow, to mm -hmm. keep up with whatever, X, mm -hmm. Y, Z, overhead, demand, inclusivity. Um, Luft can, can kind of contract a little bit and get back uh, right where the sweet spot is in, in, in our team's opinion. So I'm excited to separate these, kind of run them on opposite ends of the calendar annually. Um, Luft is that, that wild edge of the seat thing that you love or hate because the information doesn't always come in a traditional way. Yeah. I think air water will have more consistency and hopefully that brings people together more. Cause I think that when I hear from someone that's coming from Germany or Australia. They're like, dude, I need more notice. I need to be able to book flights yeah. Yeah, six yeah, months yeah. in advance. So this is an answer to a lot of the community. That's fair. If you're coming from really far away, the fucking, 
the secretive messaging is like not so charming. <laughs> like, dude, just fucking tell me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not playing this fucking game. I need to buy business class yeah, Lufthansa. Exactly. I need my upgrades. <laughs> yeah. my, I got to be first on the list. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I'll be candid. Luft and the I way mean, that we whimsical, communicate, like... <laughs> it's not always about just messing with people yeah, or yeah. keeping the attention span high. When you have to reinvent yourself every year, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of work. It's yeah, a lot sure. of red yeah. tape. And, you know, not everybody in Southern California is really keen when you, they're like, you want to bring 10,000 people and, and yeah. 2,000 cars to our place of business? Like, yeah. why don't you go to the event center? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, believe me. Uh, listen, I, I've just learned very the very, very hard way what happens when you tell, when you use the word event yes. in a city government office. Yes they have a fucking panic attack. They lose their mind. And they, even if we're talking about a, a Saturday morning cars and coffee with 50 people and a fucking jug of Starbucks, they think I'm talking about Luft. That's, yeah. what, they, that's what they hear. Or and they so see I, donuts on the rooftop yeah, and revving. Yeah. And, yeah, or I, I can't imagine when you actually are talking about an event of that size. It probably meets all of their fears. It's, <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to bore the listeners with uh, event production type stories, but I've lived it for a decade and I have a greater appreciation for people mm -hmm. who are on production, whether that's movies or events. Um, there are so many moving pieces and we all show up at the last minute, you know, and then we leave first and the, the rest is in the dust and it's, it's gnarly. It's been a good education. I'm not a formally educated guy and uh, this has been my master's degree in, in understanding business and how to speak to government and fire and safety Dude, and imagine everything. Imagine what the fucking Las Vegas GP I know. was. Well, it was over a year, right, F of production? Way more than that, but like... Dude, the fact that that, the fact that the biggest shit show story of that was a, a manhole yeah. cover drain <laughs> getting sucked out of the ground, the size of a silver dollar. Yeah, I mean it's just uh, it's it's crazy. I when I, I was there and I was very impressed at the yeah. overall efficiency, completeness, professionalism of the event, despite you know traffic. Yeah, I, I I have a great respect. I mean, when I did the first couple of events with Howie and Jeff and and the crew, it was you you guys were there. It was three or four of us wearing every hat. Yeah. When mm -hmm. we were at Universal in 2019, I looked at the list. Universal wanted the name of everybody coming through the gate who was working, and that was 400. And I thought to myself, all right, we're still not USGP at Las Vegas, but yeah. now it's become a full fledged production. We did Indianapolis in 2021, right in the middle of town. And that was a big one, too, because you, you got to think about containment. Yeah. If you're charging a ticket, you can't just pop this thing up. I get a lot of information and ideas from people who email me like, you should do your event in my town. And isn't this great? And I'm like, here's the reasons why this will yeah, never work. But sure. you don't know until you've yeah. lived it. And it's yeah. it's interesting. Oh, dude, I, I mean, it's 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 on a bigger scale, but it's the same thing of like. People are like, you should do a video on this. And there's a hundred reasons that it's not their responsibility to know right. why no, you course. shouldn't do a video yeah. on that or you no. should, you know, whatever. And I hate breaking people's heart right. because it's not that it's a bad idea. It's just that they don't have all the angles. Yeah. You know? Um, well, I'm stoked. My calendar's fucking marked. Let's uh, do it. My, my car will be detailed. Put it wherever you want. Right in front on that stage again. Uh, <laughs> I, got I, was that. I got, yeah, that. I remember uh, getting you guys loaded out because you're like, we have a long ass drive home. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that going. so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I hate leaving an empty stand, uh, but no, that, you're, that you're, was a long you're drive. You were at the right time. And then mm -hmm. on the, as we were leaving Mare Island, there was a fucking police chase right in front no of way. us. And on, I got, on the island? On the oh high, on the, right on that, on that two lane that goes back like to the, the highway. Causeway. <laughs> the, this fucking dude came in a, in a Ram 1500, came out straight sideways, and I I just saw it, out of my, and I hit the fucking shoulder in my car. This dude almost tagged me, flew up the road, and then like six cops fucking... It turned out he had stolen the car and ended up like crashing it up the road, right? Yeah, or they caught like him. That. But we were, you know, we we're going freeway speed, and this guy comes down an entrance ramp towards us, and I was like, "The truck's kind of coming." Towards the <laughs> and then behind us, it was like out of a movie. Behind us, there was like dust, truck, <laughs> hit the gravel, cops, like yeah, two it was dudes crazy. in a pink boxer with we all their baggage so top close. down. <laughs> it's yeah. like a movie scene. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. The soundtrack would have been like uh, like Diana Ross playing or something there. The By the way, what was like, the car dies? We run out of octane boost. Yeah, like yeah. What was the Dodge 
single cab short wheelbase truck that had the Viper V10 oh, SR- in it. SRT10, SRT yeah. SRT10. Yeah, the Viper that, truck. That engine. I, when so I was like silly. 16 or 17, I got the keys to a Viper GTS on an autocross course for a Skip Barber <laughs> racing school. And that engine is firmly burnt in my mind. The yeah. only other time I got to experience that engine was in a in a cat eliminator like a 30 foot eliminator with oh, that boat? ilmore built v10 <laughs> engine in it and that was i was like that's where that engine should have yeah, been from the yeah beginning. that's <laughs> off, it's an offshore racing boat i've never been in it but i i was in a place where they were running the one that had the twin uh supercharged lamborghini v12s they were diablo engines that were done for marine use and they were like 800 horsepower 900 horsepower crazy yeah, yeah, the Viper was, motor is uh, is pretty aggressive. If you search cat eliminator, you get a lot of people trying to cut their cats <laughs> off of their car. <laughs> oh, not, no. not a boat. So yeah, it's sorry. different. It's different now. I figured. Um, that's awesome. So uh, April twenty seventh in Costa Mesa, exact location, uh, TBD. Coming coming in time. We're gonna get some visuals out. Let people kind of. Uh, maybe interact with where it might be. And what's what was fun about Luft and Air Water uh, last year, at least being in the same location, and I imagine that um, this will happen again, it was that there, there was there was another like side ecosystem. There were like pre Luft parties and pre Luft meetups, and you know people were doing other things that were related that allowed someone to sort of make a weekend out of it, which is fun. Yeah, so, we work with a couple partners and collaborate on those. Other stuff is just popping up on, at other people's will. Um, we should have a couple of, of pre and post activities. Mm-hmm. Sunday's definitely going to be busy on the SoCal roads for everybody who's coming in from out of town. So, yeah, yeah we're pumped. Yeah, it'll be fun. Well, that's good. Thanks for having we me. Got a, no, no, we're not done yet. Oh. Uh, we got a few questions from the Patreon. Okay. You, do you have uh, 25 minutes or so? I'm good. Okay, of course, if you want to ask our uh, our guest questions uh, for the show, patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. You can also get an ad-free listing experience. Get the show before it goes live to the rest of the people. Get our car review videos before they go live to everybody else. And get an extra podcast every month just for you. Now, before we get to those... Uh, many of our listeners, and maybe you've seen on social media, know that I designed a watch with a Notice Watch Company, which uh, for those of us sitting in this room, the, the delivery event will be tomorrow. Um, where 50 people are coming in to collect their watches from me in person. We sold um, 300 of them. And uh, it's going to be really fun. It's very exciting. The guy who won our giveaway contest, I flew him in. He's at a hotel in Marina del Rey right now. He's going to come collect the one that he donated uh, blood to get. But <clears throat> what we have here is a uh, serial number one. Sounds like swag. S- serial number one. Here's your swag, Pat. Here's the swag. Well, it's not quite for Pat. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's for Zach. What? Whoa. This is, this is serial yeah. number one Dude. of the mint green. What? And I have Congrats. reserved it for Zach. Do you have Clapman. zero? I have zero. Okay. I have the prototype. Whoa. I get you, one? You get serial number Holy one shit. for being you. Golf club. I feel awkward as fuck now. Thank you. Holy shit. Speech. Yeah. So you wow. get uh, you got the watch, you got the auxiliary strap there, and tomorrow at the event we'll have we're gonna have watchmakers on site so they can size the bracelet for you. Dude. So that's yeah. amazing. So I thought you would enjoy that. I, I saved do enjoy it. This. I saved it just for you. That's cool. The mint. Do you, do you know I thought, this whole story? I, like I, I saw some of the posts on it, but I don't know yeah. the backstory of the company. Uh, so they're in LA, small small company, just a few folks. Oh, but uh, they approached me about designing a watch, and uh, I I really wanted to to make it my actual design, not just a variation on something that already existed, and so. All our specifications on the back, there's a topographical map of the Angeles Forest where we like to make our videos, which is pretty cool. And it's got all the hardware, all the goods, deep water resistance, um, very durable and super adjustable for every wrist. And and uh, mint green, and then we did an orange. So I thought Zach would like Congrats, the mint better Zach. than the orange. Yeah, I mean, I like so. either one, whatever. So That's there you cool. go. It's really One cool he did this. And then he did a giveaway for uh, this this charity, Be the Match, and people had to donate blood You had to or donate plasma. blood or plasma or sign up for the uh, stem cell donation registry. Nice. Um, and uh, so we got like 
250 people to sign up for the stem cell registry and then like 90 more donated blood and then some who physically couldn't do either uh, donated cash. We raised like 12 grand. And so I had a third color, a prototype of a teal that we ended up not making, but the winner of the contest gets the teal, That's right. which is pretty cool. So I would I would have gone just on the on the back of your post. That's a great idea to pull everybody together in a single focus. I mean, yeah, yeah watch cool. or not. That's that's it's a cool thing. Deal. Great thing to do. Yeah, Absolutely. and so the the dude who won, he I flew him here. He's he's put up at the Marina Del Rey Hotel in an Ocean View King Suite. And the other thing is that he's coming to the event to get his watch, and I'm taking him in the canyons in in one of my cars, and he's requested the Ferrari 328. So that will be fun and slow. He's gonna show up with a mustache for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's how here's how we know this guy's fucking on point. He rented himself a BMW 2002 off of Turo for the weekend. Nice. So, all right. Yeah, he's doing it right. Shout out to Scott. Um, so yeah, Zach will now have something to wear for the ball tomorrow uh, <laughs> as well. Um, okay, now back to the Patreon. Let's see. Okay. Bad Gardener says, I was successful in karting growing up, but decided to become a teacher instead of keeping to race. Now I coach karting on the side. What do you think adds significant value as a driving coach, and who was the best you've had? I mean, it sounds obvious, but your ability to communicate and articulate and to govern what inputs you give as a driving coach to a worthy uh, recipient is is so key i know so many drivers that are great and they can go fast but they can't really teach because their communication is either oftentimes too much too in the weeds too specific and i always when i worked with drivers and still do i sort of give them one two maximum three things to work on there's no need to go corner by corner entry, middle, exit, and give them 120 notes to go try and apply when they're out on the track. So brief, prioritized, and I also am very like philosophical. I like to use analogies and talk to them on their level. And they might be a golfer, they might be a surfer, they might be a, an equestrian enthusiast. And I think you can relate driving back to a lot of other sports because it is all about balance. Mm. Good answer. Uh, Paul says, what's the hardest part of endurance racing that no one talks about? Uh, besides going the bathroom on yourself, mm, um, all the pee. <laughs> um, no, honestly, <laughs> honestly, uh, endurance racing is glamorous. It's diverse. You've got all different types of weather and dark and light. But a three in the morning wake up call after you've mm. been driving or at the track for twelve plus hours, when you've only had an hour to finally get yourself wound down after the adrenaline. That, those were the tough moments for me, middle of the night when your body and your mind is tired and you're just l l low on sleep. Mm -hmm. no, one, no one is their best when they're sleep deprived and yeah. going out for another three hour stint when everything hurts was, you a, was when you earned your paycheck. Immediate double espresso person or do you like to go in calm and uncaffeinated and you, you just wake up because of the adrenaline or? You know, the longer I got into my career, the more refined I was with right. diet and hydration. Um, in the beginning, I was looking for those stims to either keep me busy while I was on deck, freezing my ass off at Daytona, waiting for the car to come in. Sometimes you sat on the pit lane. After you got woken up abruptly, you had 10 minutes to get to pit lane, and then you had an hour and a half to wait. Mm. So, um, no, I think that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches... Uh, we're good at any time of the day, whether you had had too much pasta or chicken or salad, um, lots of water, electrolytes, really managing the replenishment and retention of hydration mm -hmm. was so much more important than just chugging water. Yeah. And now everything I do in life is about timing of when you're having what you're having, whether you're fighting a hangover or getting ready to do the 24 hour of Le Mans. So it's, uh, it's an interesting one on that side. Mm. Uh, Derek says, who are the, some of the best gentleman drivers you've had a chance to share a car with? There are some really impressive drivers who have no childhood or early life experience racing. Um, David Hanemeyer Hansen uh, is a Dan Danish-born driver who resided part-time here in L.A. Uh, unbelievable. I met him out of sh racing school, and he told me that I want to go to the top. And I'm like, dude, you're 28 years old, and you've never raced before. And he did it. And he applied himself the same way that he applied himself to Ruby on Rails and a lot of other things that he's done in the software code writing industry. And the fitness has to be there. 
Um, the practice and the application of how much time you put into it has to be there. And then there is that part of this is either your sport or it's not. I've seen some drivers that have put in all the effort. They have all the resources behind them. They've spent all the time practicing and, and following the steps that we all followed to progress and develop into a pro level speed. But Ben Keating, um, even the uh, infamous Scott Tucker, those guys made racing their full-time job they had the ability to do that yeah well and, that money uh, earns itself <laughs> yeah they they uh they went fast you can't doubt it you what know? do you what do you think you said there's some people that did all the steps but didn't make it like it wasn't their sport do you think it's something just in like what do you think it is that stops them some innate ability they don't have or a or a childhood practice of like bicycling or, or body movement that they don't have or something? I think it's all mental. I think mm. there's a risk management aspect to things where I'm just not comfortable at the top of this ski hill and I am not going down it. That might be the mentality when you got to go flat through the Porsche curves, you know, in the in the misty wet. Mm -hmm. So I think it's often the conscious thought that that or the subconscious thought that gets in the way. But in the end, I believe performance thinking, some would call sports psychology, you can overcome a lot of that if you really understand how the brain works in a performance aspect. And that was the biggest unfair advantage in my career was understanding how the mind works. I'll, I'll summarize it by saying there were two questions that the best performance thinking coaches were asked. How do I teach myself to be my very best every time I want to perform? I know what my potential is, but I can't always get there depending on the day and the factors. And the other question or request was, how do I get my mind out of the gutter when things are not going well? Mm -hmm. Because we all as humans spiral down yeah. when shit is going wrong. You just manifest in that, you focus on that. And of course, the outcome usually, especially in racing, when you're focused on what's not going well, that quantifiably <sighs> multiplies. I was, I was literally, Shoot, I was hunting yesterday with my dad, hunting quail, and some fucking stupid shit was going on up here, 2,000 miles away. And for an hour and a half, I couldn't fucking shoot for shit. And it was 100% because of what was happening here 2,000 miles yeah, away. Yeah. Back to the coaching question, I tell people who are driving at speed, the only thing that should be on your mind is the next corner coming up. Yeah. If you're thinking about setup, if you're thinking about your boyfriend or your girlfriend well, driving is good for that if you drive it, it's easier to focus on driving yeah, on, more on, downtime on, and shooting yeah shooting your walk in between stuff and whatever so you have too much time to fucking think yeah. and if you're going 150 miles an hour it's pretty tough to focus on something else unless right. it's like overwhelming problems oh trust me it happens and yeah. that's usually when the accidents happen i remember senna told a story of when he crashed at Monaco and he was leading by a country mile. I believe he was in the McLaren and, and he said that I started thinking about the podium. I was like, I got this. And then he was in the fence. Yeah. So, you know, yes, it's it's easier to slip when you're walking down the trail with your dad <laughs> than it is uh, yeah. at 120. Yeah. Chunhound says, is there ever an occasion where it's okay to wear driving club gloves while operating a street car? Mm. Really um, hot canyon wooden wheel. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, and then don't don't show up with like your your modern Sparco suede palm uh, oh, racing yeah, gloves. No. Um, but no, I I will say I am a on road driving glove hater. But I drove a nine hundred four with a wood wheel. It was a warm day at VIR, and I went up the S's, and I was like, I'm gonna crash this car because yeah. my the the sweat on yeah. my palms on that. Wooden, hardened wooden steering wheel with a with a varnish finish. All you had to say was at. But you're at VIR. Driving gloves are okay on any track at any time. But I just thought to myself, if yeah. I drove this car on the street, yeah, I would, I would, that's, I'd give it a pass. The only that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's only okay in a in a car with a wooden or plastic, you know, wheel like a yeah. like a gull wing yeah. when it's hot out. Yeah. Then you're forgiven. Alcantara and suede. You can make arguments that you put like uh, like materials together and uh, it's better. But that one I'll leave for people to if you're debate. Wearing, if you're driving a car that's new enough to have an Alcantara steering wheel and you're wearing gloves to drive it on the street, you suck. <laughs> uh, yeah, street for sure. You suck. But I'm on talking, the street. That's the question. Yeah, okay. is so street. Oh, uh, so no, street. it says we're operating a street car. So operating a street car on the track, we're not talking yeah, about that. No, unless you have a wood 
high gloss steering wheel <laughs> or, or a base yeah, model yeah. 911 yeah. hardened steering wheel. Other thing, don't come down into the lobby of the Fairfield Inn with your red <laughs> racing boots on. <laughs> uh, and Sean, jeans. Yeah, Sean says, do you regularly wear your Rolex Daytona watches from winning 24-hour races, or do you keep them more as trophies? Um you're not I, really a Rolex guy. I don't I, see you in Rolex very often. I have long answers to these questions. These are good questions. Normally, I feel like I show up to this podcast and I only talk about Porsches or myself, and I don't know much else other than well, that's a few what, motor. That's what guests are supposed to do. Motorcycles and hot rods I can talk about. But um, the Rolex steel, so I chased that watch. I think I did 18 Rolex 24s in a row, and I refused to wear a Rolex until I hopefully won the Daytona that said winner on the back of it. Uh -huh. So all my friends, when they got their first racing paycheck, went out and bought, you know, a GMT or a sub and something. And I was like, nope, like the superstition in me, like I, I might cool. never own a Rolex, yeah. but I'm going to fricking win that. And I tell you, I got that watch. I won only one in 2009 and it was the biggest event in my sports car career where I was like, you know what? Racing doesn't owe me anything anymore. I got a Rolex Daytona. Yeah, the, we call it the hard way. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool, of course, man. now with Respect. allocations, it might actually be easier to go out and win one than to get a Rolex oh store to sell you one. Yeah, right so now. I'm right-handed. I wear my watch on my right arm, so my Daytona gets a workout, mm. reaching for the overhead bin and walking the dog oh, or so working you do on cars. Wear it. Um, yes, but it takes a beating, so I don't yeah. wear it a lot. That's okay. Um, this is a that Carrera watch... that I bought in 04, and I wear the hell out of this. It's never been serviced, and I, you know, I scratch them up. Sure. But... I'm also wearing a Tag Heuer Carrera today, the uh, Rowing Blazers collab. But um, if if a Rolex Daytona says 24 hours winner on the back of it, the amount of uh, wear and tear on the watch itself will add to its value really? and not take away from right. it. Yeah. Well, then I need to talk to you offline about the uh, proper way to service these watches to oh. get them to tell a little bit more I have consistent a guy. time. I have the guy. And to make sure that I don't uh, get a switcheroo when no, I no, bring no, that I, watch I have in. the guy. Shout out to a Marina Bay watch company in Marina Del, right, Del Rey. Well, I'm they service all of my shit. They're good, honest, small business folks. I love them. He, the will best. he let me stand there while he services it? <laughs> he, this, guy's, this guy would be so stoked to be servicing a 24 hours winter watch. He'd oh, be I'd really, be stoked to be in, really, the, in what, the cutting what room. What finish with him. is it? It is stainless and it's the white. Oh, uh, that's face. a good one. Yeah. Sometimes Rolex gets a little more and they, well, they, they more sometimes, lately. Sometimes they throw their garbage in there. The fucking ugly dials on an ugly two tone. I mean, imagine all the work to win a race. It's like fucking two tone. No, tell me the proper terminology of my watch. It's pearl and stainless, right? It's pearl. Well, the the is the dial mother of pearl. Oh, I don't know if it's mother. Is of it pearl, white? But it's pearl white. Yeah. Is it like white or is it actually pearl? I like, should know this. No, it's more white. Okay. Yeah. If it's, it's not the it's not the uh, very grayish pearl. No. Like they have, I have a Daytona that like I did not pearl. win in a race. That is actual. It's called. It's not a pearl. Is the round thing when the when you have something that's flat, but it's mother of pearl. Got it. And they do make a mother of pearl watch, and it's hmm. extremely dope. Um, I would be amazed if they gave you one of those for, for no, twenty four hours. So. But at least it's a steel one. Yeah, I don't even know yeah. what I have. And but like, for if you beat that watch up, and it's like that's that's the provenance of that watch. Cool. That's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, wear it. Fucking don't. Yeah, serve it. And when they service it at Marina Bay Watch Company, they won't polish it. They nice. won't touch it. It's just mechanical service. Nice. Yeah, they're ace. Love them. Uh, that's a great story. I'm glad you told that story. Uh, I think we kind of answered solitary heroes question earlier flannel bob says what is the hardest cornering car that you have ever driven highest g corner you've ever experienced at a racetrack i've heard stories of the toyota uh, prototype breaking the ribs of its drivers yeah i've uh i'm not a big guy but um i've grown up racing go-karts and there's a lot of g's and a lot of body fatigue and karting so i thought i was ready for four g's lateral g's in a race car but it's fast. Um, I'd say the RS Spider, um, 2006, 7, and 8 V8 Porsche open top prototype. Uh, turn one in Atlanta, turn one at Mosport. 
Um, you turn in flat, and it's basically you against— Turn one at Road Atlanta flat. Well, yeah. I mean, it was a turn in flat. There was a breathe. Yeah. But the last corner, for instance, at Road Atlanta was flat, flat on the floor, the even in downhill. the wet. And so, I'm yeah. in the wet? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it pushes— Yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, it, it, it pushes— Racing's not my sport. You need to <laughs> I don't have that. But, but these I couldn't do that in a fucking Miata, dude. <laughs> And the other part is the braking. The braking, yeah. carbon brakes on a car this light is so intense that the back of my neck, I remember being at the hotel wherever we were racing this car, and mm. just everything was lit up just from uh. the braking Gs. I remember when a few of my friends went in any car for the first time, they tightened the tethers on their Hans devices so, oh, so tight because they, could, they the... could not keep their head yeah. up halfway through the day of practice. But I wow. got really lucky when I went out in that uh, Valkyrie, Pro, uh, the AMR Pro with... Um, Oh, Andy Prio. And I was lucky that I was so, such a big guy that I could actually wedge my head oh, yeah. into the roof, which Johnny, who's three inches shorter than me, went out and he said his neck was like so fucked from the braking G's. And I was like, well, mine was just <laughs> wedged in the roof. So I was good there. Sometimes you, yeah, sometimes yeah. you got to use a, a <laughs> yeah. fixed area to keep your head still. God, this, oh, that RS Spider, what a pretty race car. That, that was, was stiff. We raced that at Long Beach and it banged me up. I mean, I remember my body <laughs> being bruised, knees ankles, shoulders. Um, the 962, which obviously is a much earlier generation car, no power steering, e almost equal in downforce, mm -hmm. turbocharged, more horsepower. Uh, that car I just recently raced at the Rolex reunion and at the Rensport reunion and serious serious downforce, serious Gs, no power steering. That's the biggest difference. With the RS Spider, we had power steering. So to the listener's question, um, the forces in the steering wheel were most legit in a 2006 Jordan Formula One car or a 962. Mm. Um, are you having fun driving those vintage F1 cars? Dude. Uh, it's, they seem gnarly. It's awesome. The The car I raced two the years ago, The one you, when, you when I saw you at Long Beach and yeah. you were like, this car is sketchy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that was a FW07. That was a Williams Formula One car from 1983, I believe. The last year they raced at Long Beach. Mm. The, the hardest part is that Cosworth you're, you gotta be fully committed. It does not run at partial throttle. It does not run at low RPM. So I remember being out in that car and just saying to myself, all right, this has to happen now. You just need to sack up and commit and grab the bull by the horns and rip this car with every experience and talent that you've ever experienced in your life. And it worked, but there's no working up to it. Yeah. Flat bottom, not a big amount of downforce, so pretty visceral, pretty fundamentally easy to drive, but to make it go fast, high risk. I mean, your feet are where that number 10 is, Zach. I yeah. mean, your feet are the impact zone. and It seems so dangerous. Honeycomb, there's no carbon fiber, yeah. so it's it's much less safety. No head no head and neck restraint, lateral, no, none, nothing that we have in modern Formula 1 cars. That's fucking cool. Those were when men were men. And what is in it for... Whoever is paying you to drive this thing, like what? What is in it for that? You know the drive the the owners that I drive for. Um, sometimes we're driving together, and they want my input on setup. Um, they want the data, and they want to experience the weekend together. But for the private owners who don't drive anymore because they're either stepped out of the car, never did drive, or mm. age caught up with them, they want to see the car win. Yeah. Tom Malloy, uh, you know, with the Leighton House 962 at Long Beach, he's he's a racer. He's a dirt track racer. He's a hot rodder. He's a sports car guy. And he said, I want to see this car win. I don't really want you to wreck it. Yeah. I don't want you to hurt yourself, but I want to freaking win. Yeah. One last question, because because uh, actually Zach has to go at, after this one, um, but that's okay. Ninety minutes of radio is a good amount of radio. Tim A says, "Are you optimistic about the inevitable hybrid 911? Does the prospect of pairing the hybrid to a naturally aspirated 3.6 engine, which is rumor by the way right now, we don't know that it's naturally aspirated, make it more digestible?" I definitely think hybrid for me as a purist is is more digestible. Um, it also removes that range anxiety. And when I go back to the first time I drove a hybrid 911, which was the GT3R hybrid, which had the flywheel. The flywheel, yes. yeah. Um, it was very cool. I don't think that any future car from Porsche will follow that full trajectory, but there's always lessons learned from the track. And you get the best of both worlds. If you've got the right combustion engine, plus the hybrid for efficiency and launch and linear power down low, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of combustion hybrid. Well, the way Porsche usually does their hybrids is it, it's going to be a Turbo S hybrid, probably, right? Because they did that with Panamera. They did it with Cayenne. I know nothing. Um, but those products are excellent. Yeah. Um, Panamera, Panamera Turbo Hybrid is fucking awesome. Yeah, if you haven't driven and one, they rip. They are <laughs> so fast. And, and I, last year, I got one from Porsche, and I led one of the road and track rallies with it. I drove uh, 800 miles, and I didn't tell anybody, but I was my whole goal the whole time was to uh, get over 30 miles per gallon average and have nobody notice that I was doing an efficiency challenge. So I'd be carrying, like, massive speed into the corner and like coasting and playing with the settings a bit to optimize it. But I achieved like almost 32 miles per gallon over 800 miles, like driving like fast. Yeah. Um, they're just so great at that. What about when you were in like full sport plus whammy mode? Did you ever think to yourself, there's a compromise somewhere in this system? It no, feels... but Cayennes and Panameras are already so heavy that it's not like I'm like, oh, not every gram isn't optimized. It's just yeah. like it has the tech to make the car go fast. That's my only concern with 911 is that the weight of the battery will somehow make it worse. Because like I love a Targa, but if you drive a GT3 and then you drive a Targa, you can feel the weight difference sure. like immediately. Yeah. And it's not great, right. you know, but for a daily or for like a, th a car that'll probably run like a nine, seven quarter mile, right. you know, all right, cool. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, I think that uh, where that weight is placed is always something I'm passionate about and proud of with Porsche. I remember mm -hmm. the first generation Panamera, they showed on a presentation where that weight exists and where the driver positioning was. And it was all about center of gravity and placement in sort of a performance engineering spec. And some could well, argue- Tycon does that so well too. There you go. Yeah. Uh, some could argue everybody does that, but I will say no. Everybody yeah. doesn't put that amount of technology no. and, and engineering into it. I'm excited to try the electric Boxster, actually. I think that'll be a neat product. I, I mean, I, I do. I, it may not make me want to sell my pink car to buy one, but that doesn't mean it won't be a neat product. I think it'll probably be cool. Yeah, I think it's all about what your driving conditions are and what you're using the car for. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for coming. Really yeah, appreciate it. Me. Airwater, uh, April uh, April 27th, Costa Mesa, California. Is there, what's what's the website for it? Where can, it's air-water.com. Air-water.com. Air yeah, yeah air-water.com. Um, there's some merch up there. You can uh, get uh, notifications for the event. And, and by the time you guys are hearing this, at least not Patreon people, but Tuesday the 16th uh, for the general public, you'll be able to buy tickets, right? Yep. And register vehicles? Yep. Enter. Enter your Sorry, vehicle. Enter, enter to be registered. Enter your vehicle and, yeah, get some tickets. We'll see yeah, you then. That's going to be fun. Thanks, be a man. party. Thanks for coming. Uh, all right, cool. Bye, everybody.